Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's edition of the Seekers Forum. I hope you're having a very, very good weekend. And let's say hi to Jay. How are you, Jay? Doing good, Mark. Good to see you, and great to be here with everybody. Good. Nice to see you, Jay. Thank you. So we're going to be looking today at awakening through nature and what it is that changes within us in the presence of wilderness. Away from the turmoil of civilized life, something comes alive in us that lies dormant much of the time. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who devoted much of his life to understanding this aliveness, put it this way, quote, to the mind and body which have been cramped by noxious work for company, nature is medicinal and restores their tone. The tradesman, the attorney, comes out of the din and craft of the street and sees the sky and woods and is a man again. That's the revivifying power of nature. It brings us back to ourselves to awaken our innate wilderness and nourish the well of vitality within, the deep solitude that we share with nature, which links us more deeply, paradoxically, to everyone and everything around us. The wildness of nature liberates the mind and reminds a person of her true origins. In turn, this instills a lost sense of wholeness, and the awareness that we never actually left the garden, contrary to what conventional religious thinking tells us. This is, of course, what we were talking about last month in regards to original blessing, that we are still in the garden. We were never expelled from the garden of nature and unity. The vastness of the natural world dwarfs our human problems and provides a wider cosmic perspective. When we're free of our man-made surroundings, Emerson says that a wild delight runs through a man in spite of real sorrow. A wild delight runs through a man in spite of real sorrow. Nature says he is my creature, and in spite of all his impertinent griefs, he shall be glad with me. Isn't that wonderful? In spite of all his impertinent griefs, he shall be glad with me. That's what nature is whispering to us when we come into her presence. This gladness and our wildness are, in fact, one and the same. But unfortunately, in our increasingly prefabricated lives, we suffer from a malady that's quite new in the history of our species, and that's the anxiety of separation from the natural world. The physiological, psychological, and spiritual effects of this perceived separation are profound. Studies show that even the tiniest dose of nature improves our health. For example, when we have flowers and foliage in our hospital rooms, post-surgery patients need fewer painkillers and report less fatigue. Merely looking at pictures of nature speeds up mental restoration and improves cognitive functioning. There's an unreality, a kind of second-handedness to how we live in a world where convenience is held to be the highest value, convenience over quality getting more done faster with more technological support. Because of this, we yearn for natural, raw experience, for things that are real and unvarnished, because we long for the real, unvarnished part of ourselves. Why else would educated people dole out thousands of dollars to companies like Outward Bound for the opportunity to be dropped off in the middle of nowhere in order to fend for themselves in the wild? It's because encountering nature without filters is a kind of initiation. When we match our pulse to the heartbeat of nature, we touch into her perennial rhythms and harness ourselves to the universal power. Such experiences still the mind. They refine our character and they sensitize the heart. They also plunge us into the present moment. Recovering a sacred connection to the earth, you experience a whole new world one whose beatitude is always accessible to you, no matter how long you've forgotten it. This homecoming quiets the chattering, clamoring thoughts that interfere with our being able to hear the silence of the green world. As Emerson wrote, in the woods, I feel that nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. Observing nature, we learn to read her laws. This offers us profound lessons in resilience, balance, aliveness, 
as well as struggle, desire, impermanence, and transformation. The industriousness of the ant, the majesty of the eagle, the preternatural stillness of forests, the loyalty of dogs, the independence of cats, the self-nourishing bodies of forests that turn leaves into nutritious earth. All of these teach us different lessons about how we can live our lives. As Emerson puts it, the moral influence of nature upon every individual is that amount of truth which it illustrates to him. But who can estimate this? Who can guess how much firmness the sea-beaten rock has taught the fisherman? How much tranquility has been reflected to man from the azure sky, over whose unspotted deeps the winds forevermore drive flocks of stormy clouds and leave no wrinkle or stain? How much industry and providence and affection we have caught from the pantomime of brutes? Now, by brutes, Emerson means animals that lack language to describe their experience. But in fact, our facility for language is central to how we separate ourselves from nature as well as from our wildness. It's through language that we come to label things and lose contact with the things themselves. You could say that language upholsters the mind, making it difficult to touch reality through the cushion of adjectives, nouns, and verbs. Words cause divisions that might be avoided. Remember Juliet's soliloquy to Romeo, where she talks about how the young lovers' respective labels render connection between them impossible. Tis but thy name that is my enemy, Juliet tells him from her balcony. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Isn't that beautiful? Labels lead to artificial separations that nature automatically bridges. And this immediacy puts us face to face with mystery, with the unknowability of things exactly as they are. Unfortunately, this unknowability makes human beings deeply uncomfortable, even as we long for it. We don't like feeling out of control, which happens when we stop naming things. And so we use concepts, labels, and stories to structure what is essentially unstructurable, the wildness of life itself, the wildness of God. In the same way that we place grids on the indivisible earth to create states and countries and territories that don't actually exist. Fortunately, nature always wins. That's the good news. When we turn ourselves over to the force greater than us, her imminent presence, it has the power to suspend the narrative mind. And that's how awe works as well. Awe stops the mind. It yanks us into the here and now. It imprints the memory and the imagination with details that never leave us thereafter. Think about moments of awe that you've had in your life. Aren't the details more vivid to you than the details of so-called ordinary life? That's because we feel more alive in moments of awe, because the mind is stilled. It elicits in us the desire to connect to everything that exists, what Emerson calls a raging passion for the whole. In union with the wildness of things, we come to remember the rhythms of nature herself. It's comparable to a baby laying its head on its mother's breast and hearing her heartbeat and regulating its breathing to hers. This connection, this union with the mother, heals a very deep wound within us. There's a beautiful Hindu story that compares the unenlightened man to an infant crying in its mother's lap. He cries and cries until finally he looks up through his tears and sees the mother smiling down at him. When he sees her smile, he learns to smile too knowing that he is a part of this great mother, never separate and never alone. And that's what happens when we come to recognize God in nature and nature within ourselves. There's a field known as biopoetics that describes this entanglement very beautifully. Biopoetics states that we can understand living things through the aliveness that we share with them. That's our means of understanding the shared aliveness that we have with all other living things. Andreas Weber, who's the German biologist who founded Biopoetics, uh, puts it this way. 
Everything tends toward or longs for connection. Throughout nature, we witness the same basic striving toward a deeper experience of oneself through another, which is the core of our aliveness. From the simplest cell to the most evolved human, the impulse to connect predominates since life is first and foremost a shared process of mutual transformation and productivity. Let me just repeat that. Everything tends toward or longs for connection. Throughout nature, we witness the same basic striving toward a deeper experience of oneself through another, which is the core of our aliveness. From the simplest cell to the most evolved human, the impulse to connect predominates since life is first and foremost a shared process of mutual transformation and productivity, unquote. This principle of mutuality is what dissolves false dualities and increases our enlivenment. And here's another paradox. In order to rest in this connection, we must first know how to experience solitude. While we're programmed biologically to seek attachment and affiliation, cooperation, social connection, we also need time alone for self-realization. It takes courage to step away from the crowd and the man-made world. Confronting ourselves free of distraction is a rite of passage. That's the initiation that happens when we enter nature without language. In order to discover that, quote, the highest dwells in him, that the sources of nature are in his own mind, as Emerson says, a person must go into his close and shut the door since God will not make himself manifest to cowards. Just think about that. In order to know our wildness, in order to know ourselves, we must be brave. Realization is impossible until we're willing to step away and experience that part of ourselves that is primal, that is original, that is essential to our being. The psychologist D.W. Winnicott put it differently. He said, the person who has developed the capacity to be alone is never alone. With this tolerance for solitude comes a kind of youthfulness and a childlike wonder. Just as nature is always beginning again, refreshed by her own extravagance, so are you and I kept young by imagination, by regeneration, by connection to the earth. Perceiving nature stripped of human artifice, we find ourselves overwhelmed, and this astonishment is itself a form of wisdom. Is it not better to intimate our astonishment as we pass through this world, Emerson asked, if it be only for a moment? I will lift up my hands and say cosmos. Is it not better to intimate our astonishment as we pass through this world, if only for a moment? I will lift up my hands and say cosmos. Cosmos was the Greek word for beauty, and not just any beauty, but beauty that's imbued with natural order and with uh, intelligence. Beauty itself, of course, has profound healing powers. Without it, the soul begins to atrophy. So the question is, what can we do to preserve this connection, to preserve this wildness? How do we hold on to this precious resource that's so much under threat in our overcivilized lives. Here's a list of just a few things to think about that I find helpful. The first is to step out of time. By whatever means you do this, whether it's through meditation, whether it's through moments in nature, whether it's through dance, whether it's through you know, something that just is embodied without engaging the mind, find ways of stepping out of time because it's in that eternal now, in that presence that we come alive in the ways that we're talking about. The second is to get embodied, get embodied, come down from the cogitating brain into the rest of the body and be there. It's silent there. There's no language there. And that absence of language is what makes us aware of what's beyond the discursive left brain that keeps us so preoccupied and so separate from what's going on around us. Similarly, The next recommendation is to stop talking. You know, find periods of the day when you are silent. Even if it's 10 minutes here and there, it will settle your thinking. It will bring you more into the body. You'll stop looking outward for approval and for proof of your own existence. 
And you will see how language separates you from things as they are, this compulsion to label and to describe and to create stories. The next advice is to connect to Eros in whatever way it appeals to you. Eros, of course, is not just sexuality. Eros is anything that links us to that animating force of the universe, that force that through the green fuse drives the flower, that erotic force. So whether it's the natural world, whether it's sexuality, whether it's touch, massage, that kind of thing, anything that touches into that Eros will also awaken the wildness within. The next point is to seek beauty. Seek beauty wherever you can find it. Beauty enlivens the soul. It heals the wound of separation that we feel from not only from nature, but from ourselves. Beauty unifies. Beauty elevates. And it touches us into what is larger, what's beyond the, uh, the small ego and the limited mind. The next point is to challenge fear. It's by challenging fear that we keep our wildness alive. You know, we tend to be over-domesticated. You know, we're so obedient. We're taught to color inside the lines, to not, you know, not challenge the status quo, to not challenge authority. And those are all things that squelch our originality, our desire, and the part of us that is free. Because, of course, wildness essentially is our freedom. The next, remember to play, whatever play means to you. Play, in order to be play, needs to have no functional use. It needs to be something that gives you joy, something that brings humor into your life, because, of course, laughing and humor are also part of how we loosen this rigid shell of thinking and labeling and story making that we we exist inside. So remember to laugh, remember to play, whatever that means to you. The next, similarly, is to step out of your day-to-day life. And this can mean anything from travel to changing routines, to spiritual practice, to emotional adventures with lovers and friends. Whatever it takes to lift you out of the everyday, the diurnal, the thing that is just, that feels like your little package, your little container, will awaken your wildness and will connect you to the nature that is uncivilized, that's pre-civilized and doesn't need to be controlled because it in fact sustains us and keeps us alive. And finally, cultivate shamelessness and what the French call je m'en foutisme. Cultivate the willingness to not care about what people think. Je m'en foutisme is is the art of not really giving a damn and allowing ourselves to be abandoned to the moment and not constantly be projecting into the future about what might happen or reflecting, ruminating over the past and how we've gotten where we are and what we think that we can expect of our lives. Because shamelessness is freedom. So cultivate shamelessness and ask yourself, what would it mean to have less shame? Where do you keep yourself over-civilized, over-domesticated, small, frightened, precisely because shame terrifies you into minding your P's and Q's and walking the straight and narrow? So those are some suggestions for how to connect to nature, how to enliven ourselves through wildness and through shamelessness. So Jay, why don't we pull up the card and let's do a little bit of writing. Here we go. I'd like you now, please, to take 15 minutes to write about how you can be more shameless, wild, and free. Okay, what can you do today in your life as it is to become more shameless, wild, and free. I want you to be as specific as you can be, please. We'll take 15 minutes to do that, and then we'll come back together as a group. 